very, very excited to be here um, partnering with, with Palo Alto Networks. It's been a long time coming, actually. We've been working on this thing for about a year and a half now, and finally we're here. So um, I'm going to actually start. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about Azure, um, some of the features, and then at the end, we're going to talk about the security and, and the networking portion. So we're, on, we're in 28 regions worldwide. Um, we are growing very, very fast. Uh, we have over 100 data centers, uh, twice the size of our competitor, Amazon, and six times the size of Google. Um, we made huge, huge investments uh, in these data centers, over $15 billion. Um, opening two new ones in Canada, um, two in UK, and uh, two new ones in Germany. Um, so yeah, we're, we're growing really, really fast. We also have data centers that are purely for government, and we also have open ones that are just for, for uh, enterprises. Compliance-wise, we, we have a pretty nice resume. Um, FIPS uh, 142, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty popular one. We, we also have HIPAA. Um, on, a, on a regional basis, you know, China, UK, um, Singapore, Australia, these are some of the, the big ones that, that, uh, that are actually pretty tough to get. And the, the coming ones, uh, Department of Defense, uh, Criminal Justice System, uh, the L3 for, for uh, Defense Information System uh, are the ones that are coming soon. Our momentum is, is very, very fast. Um, these are just some of the numbers. And again, just looking at the numbers, for instance, for the storage objects, over 50 trillion objects. Um, so this just kind of shows you uh, the amount of infrastructure that we have built and, and we can support. Um, just to add to that, uh, 425 million active, uh, active Directory users. Again, massive, massive numbers. And just uh, thinking about hosting this on a, on a on a, on a private data center is going to be just phenomenal. We are growing. We're adding a whole bunch of, oh. And we are having some problems with the PowerPoint. Anyway, okay. this is supposed to say that we're, having, we're adding a lot of um, applications and services, over 500 plus. Uh, there we go. Didn't really work out. But yeah, for, lots and lots of applications, everything from, from um, event managers to, to office stuff, tons and tons and tons of applications and that, we're, that we're adding in um, over and over again. Our stack is, is pretty huge, so uh, just to kind of give you an overview, at the bottom, you're going to see the 28 regions. Uh, 24 of them are online. Um, as I said, we're adding more. Next level is going to be our infrastructure services, which is um, our compute level, our storage, and our networking. Compute level, uh, we just, a couple of months ago, we actually uh, announced um, support for containers, so Dockers and as well as Windows containers that are coming up. Um, our storage is going to be our Azure files, our blobs, and, and premium storage, which actually guarantees a certain IOPS in compared to normal storage. So if you have an application that's, that's IOP um, sensitive, that's the one that you would go for. And then our networking stat, stat is, again, virtual networks, um, load balancers, and you know, so on and so forth, which is pretty standard. What is actually really exciting is our platform services. And, and the, again, this is just some of the applications and some of the services that we offer. Um, if you kind of look on the, on the left-hand side under security and management, um, you're going to see the uh, things like Key Vault um, in there that, that we just added about, a, about six months ago which essentially, um, I guess in a way, it defeats the purpose of uh, holding any kind of cer certificates or passwords on the application and service. This is a service that you can actually interact with on a secure basis, and, and it keeps track of all the certs in a secure manner. It's actually physical hardware that's installed in each, in each data center, um, and, and that's, that's how it actually, and it's, it is one, it's FIPS 140-2 certified. So this is the part that we're actually going to talk about, the, the networking and security session. So yesterday I was at a roundtable, and there are a lot of confusion in terms of what, are, what, is, a, what is a VNet in, in Azure? What is a virtual network in Azure? Um, and, and what are the services around it? What can you do? What can you not do with it? So 
through these slides, I'm just going to kind of give you a very brief in, uh, introduction in terms of what are these services and what they do. A uh, virtual network, the way that you can think of it is when you actually uh, make a deployment in Azure, when you put a, a VM in, in an Azure, you put it in, in a virtual network, and that's essentially your, your network, just like your network on-prem. On um, through that, you can actually create subnets, you can create uh, user-defined routes, um, and it's completely isolated. It's isolated from everything else. You can have multiple subnets, and you can say that if you want any kind of information to go from subnet A to subnet B, you route it through subnet C. So essentially, you can create your own gateway within it. Um, from, a, from an Azure perspective, um, when you have a virtual network, you can actually assign um, these things that we call NSGs in there. So it's, these are network security groups. And what NSG does is that um, it tells you these ports are open, these ports are closed, um, and this is if, if a route, if, a, if traffic is coming from, from certain port, a point, port it's going to get um, it's going to get uh, nadded to a to an internal port inside so you can close and open ports on, on your ne on your network through NSGs um, as I said so if you have two networks if you have two vnets the only way that you can connect them to is, is through a VPN because again they're very isolated so they have their own address space and again they don't communicate outside of that so connection between them is done through VPN um, the next level again on, on the on the on the endpoint side, that's where the Azure is. So you can say that anything that's coming in to, to, to a certain port, um, port or, or a URL is going to get um, um, forwarded to, to a certain v, uh, VNet. And then the last layer is going to be Azure. So if there's any kind of attacks or things like that, we have some basic, some, well, maybe not so basic, but we, we do have some protection in terms of for, DDA, for DDoS. We do, whoops, we do some. Um, uh, things like uh, IPS and things like that. So if there's any kind of weird network traffic that's going on in the back end, we detect that and we stop that. But if you kind of think about it, if you, if you, ha if you do have an application, if you do have a network, you do need something kind of sitting at the endpoint uh, section. That's where the Palo Alto Networks firewall uh, solution is going to come in. Kind of going back again, this is it's, it's a very it kind of puts everything together. So you have your corporate network, you have your uh, Azure cloud network. You can connect them together, and again, you can have, as I said, you can have different subnets in there. You can have a DMZ, which is where you actually would put your firewalls. You can connect it to th through VPN or, or uh, using Express Route. Um, you can have AD in, uh, on your on your um, private network, and it can do uh, ADFS with the with the cloud. So everything just becomes connected and becomes one. Uh, one huge network. Um, last month, we actually introduced uh, Azure Stack. So essentially, what Azure Stack is that it's um, Azure on-prem. So again, you can the way that you would actually write your applications, you can actually go across uh, public and and private network. Again, and it would follow this exact same model. You would have your subnets online. You would have your 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 network uh, on your on your on-prem, and you would connect them together. And again, when, when the traffic is coming in from the internet, it's, it's completely just, uh, they, don't, they don't notice any kind of difference. All the routing is done automatically through Azure Stack and through Azure. So with that, um, I'm going to have some, some QA. Uh, we'll do QA at the end. Uh, but with that, I'll just hand it off to, to Jigger, and he's going to be able to talk to Palo Alto Network Solution. Thanks. OK. OK, I am on, hopefully. OK. So, Sean gave you a quick overview on Azure. So just a quick show of hands, how many of you are in public cloud? I know most of my audience is still the same. So a lot of you are in the public cloud. Anybody exploring to go into Azure or already in Azure? Okay, quite a few of you, okay. So what I'm gonna talk about is that Sean gave you a quick introduction to Azure. I'm gonna give a little deter, detailed dive on uh, how to go about securing Azure, right? So the first thing is a cloud provider gives you an ability to protect your environment in a couple of ways. One, the Azure infrastructure itself has got a lot of core capabilities, right? They do a really good job of making sure the compute, network, storage, and all their services are extremely redundant, right? This is probably better than what you can build in any of your data centers unless you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, right? 
So they take care of the security off the cloud. They protect their environment really well. I'm sure, you can go to their website and look at all the videos on how they protect their infrastructure. But once a packet comes into your side of the house, meaning your virtual network in the cloud, they give you some tools, right? Sean mentioned ACLs and NSG, network security groups. So these are standard port protocol components that you can put in and say, I only want this type of traffic to come into my virtual network in the cloud. You say, I allow port 80 and maybe from these IP addresses only. So they give you that kind of ACL capability that allows you basic security. They give you some other basic tools also. But the idea is, in a public cloud environment, it's always a shared security model. They protect this cloud itself. You're responsible for protecting your cloud deployment inside it, right? So that's the first component. It's a shared model. Now, if you were in my previous AWS session, the idea is that it's quite similar when you're going to go protect the public cloud. The first thing that people worry about is visibility. In your private network, you're very used to knowing what is going on. As a Palo Alto Networks customer, you have really good visibility on the application, the users. You look at your ACC dashboard, you have very good understanding of what's going on. But when the packet hits that Azure virtual network, <coughs> It's really hard to know where it came from, what kind of packet is it, what is the application type, and how does it go across your network in Azure, right? So visibility is the number one thing most people want. The next thing is, now you got some basic tools from Azure, which is this NSG and ACL capability. But there's also a lot of other outdated tools that people are trying to use. So the idea is, you want to bring a consistent security technology in the cloud and on your premises. So that is one thing, because you don't want one set of policies in the cloud, another set of policies in the enterprise, and then have two sets of admins trying to keep things synchronized, right? And the third element is, for, in terms of security for the cloud, is trying to have more and more automation, right? If you look at the Azure infrastructure, you can go to the web UI and do stuff, you can do CLI-based things, and you can do API-based things. You can just use API to deploy hundreds of virtual machines. Why would you not have that same capability in your security technology? API and template-based approach is what the cloud is built for. So these are things that we're looking to solve with PanOS uh, and with VM series. So the VM series for Azure, as was announced yesterday, Right? Essentially, it's the same OS that you have on your hardware firewalls. It's just virtualized to run in Azure. It is the same OS that we support on Hyper-V and other virtualized environments. It's got the same security features that you already use, meaning threat prevention, IDS, IPS, wildfire, URL filtering, global protect, all those capabilities are exactly the same. And you can manage it via Panorama, same way, there's no difference. And it's really built for that automation and orchestration. So when I say automation, here's one of the features that we built specifically in this release to enable more easier automation. This is the feature called bootstrapping that was mentioned. The idea is you create a simple Azure disk. It's a data disk. It's a VHD in their world. You put in your configuration, your licenses if you want. Bring your own license. You can put content meaning URLs filtering signatures, threat prevention signatures, and so on. You can put software updates. So we are at 7.1.0 right now. A few months later, we have a new version, 7.1.2. You can put content, uh, software versions in that data disk. And you can put information to say, when this VM launches, I want it to be attached to a Panorama device group. You got the initial policy at deployment, and then Panorama is going to do feature management and push dynamic policy down to manage that device. The way you would use it, you would build this VHD, and then when you're deploying the VM, you attach it to the VM. Now, the VM normally has at least an OS disk, that's its image, to launch itself. That comes from the Azure marketplace. And you can additionally attach a data disk to it, and now your VM is fully configured at deployment. After deployment, you don't need to go manually configure it. It's fully ready for management. and operations at that point. So that's what we meant by automation and orchestration. We're enabling a lot of these automated deployments with these new features. Okay. So the idea is one or more firewalls, you're able to quickly 
create more firewalls on demand as needed. So let's do a little deeper dive to look at the networking, right, and see how does the firewall actually get deployed in your virtual network in Azure. So these are sort of the four common use cases that we see for use of public cloud. So the first one is hybrid. The vast majority of our customers, you, are enterprise customers. You're looking to extend your existing data center into the Azure cloud. So this might be either an IPsec connection that goes into Azure or an express route that goes up into Azure, right? Express route is their dedicated connectivity from your data center to your colo, like Equinix, that goes into the Azure data center, right? You're basically looking to extend your on-prem data center to leverage additional assets in the cloud, right? That's hybrid. The next one is segmentation, meaning you've got an Azure deployment in there, your Azure virtual network. This is typically a slash 16 CIDR that you've got up there. And then you've got applications that are typically multi-tier. You may have subnet one, subnet two, or app tier one, app tier two. And when app tier one talks to app tier two, you wanna make sure that only a particular application and a particular user is going across. So that is basically protecting against lateral threats, right? If your web front end is exposed to the internet, users can come in, but you don't want the user to try to go automatically to your database tier, for example, right? So that's segmentation, right, which you're familiar with. Then there is obviously the internet gateway, which is more internet-facing applications, right? Meaning you have a web server that is an e-commerce site, you have end users coming in over the open internet, and this is where obviously you've got the greatest vulnerability in a sense, because you're opening up access directly from the outside. So how do you protect that? And then, because Azure has this vast network of data centers across the world that Sean mentioned, you could have your own colos and physical colos or you know, something that you rent from a carrier, but instead now you have an orchestrated way of doing this on the Azure fabric. So the idea is to use VM series as a global protect gateway across the world using the Azure infrastructure, right? The idea is that, let's say you have a user in Singapore trying to access your network. Traditionally, they would just VPN over the open internet to your VPN concentrator located in your corporate office. If you're largely geographically distributed, you may have additional data centers around the world. Those are slightly more expensive deals, you know, a few thousand dollars a month. Instead, you could run a VM series gate as a global protect gateway in a number of data centers in Azure. You could have one minimum running everywhere or regions you expect to serve more. And then, for example, when you have an event like this, you can spin up additional instances, especially with bootstrapping, it's really easy. You can spin up additional VMs on demand or as you need, and they'll serve additional users, and then you can scale it down when you don't need them, right? So that gives you the power of using the Azure infrastructure with our security capabilities. So let me do a, even a deeper dive beyond the deployment and say, how does the firewall itself work in Azure? So Sean mentioned a basic capability in the Azure network where VMs can talk to each other directly. So if you create an Azure VNet, for example, I'm showing you an example, 10.0.0 16. I've got two subnets let's say a web server subnet and a database subnet. By default, in Azure, there is something called as a system router. It just sits in the background. You don't see it kind of. You spin up a VM, it gets an IP address, and by default, it sends all its packets to the system router. Everything goes to the system router. So when a VM in subnet one wants to talk to a VM in subnet two, it just says I wanna, you know, sends a packet to subnet two, the packet goes to the system router, system router delivers it on the other VM, right? It's simple networking. You don't have to do anything special to connect the two subnets. There's nothing needed because the system router takes care of it. Now, how do you insert a firewall in the flow, right? We're not gonna see packets in that case. All packets go from VM1 to VM2. We never see the packets. So to secure these environments where you want to do lateral segmentation between subnets or even north-south, in and out, Azure introduced a feature called as user-defined routing. So these are route tables that you can use to force all packets through the firewall. So here's how it works. You've got subnets. What you would go do is you deploy the firewall and say, okay, I want this interface. In this case, I'm showing ETH2. That's my trust interface. 
That's my internal interface. That's what I want to use to bridge between all the subnets inside the VNet. What you would do is you create a route table, and all the route table says is packets going to subnet 2, so 1002, should go to the firewall, which is 1003.5. All packets for the other subnet, 1000/24, go to 10.035. And then 0.0, you know, basically internet-bound traffic, everything else should also go to this firewall single interface. I can get into t additional technical details on how that's constructed, but you can look at the Azure website and see how the user-defined routing works. But the idea is we're forcing all packets to go through the firewall at all times. This is what gives you that security protection so that you have a VM, it doesn't try to leak out packets and bypass the firewall. This is what makes sure that all your security policies get applied in the Azure VNet, right? Let me pause here for a minute and give you the chance to ask questions. I know I plan to ask, let you ask questions later. I wanna make sure this UDR stuff is really clear. Yes, go ahead, sir. Why do you, why do you three different routes? Why do you do three routes? Why can't you just have the cloud zero? So, what you have to do is that you have to define very specific routes to force the packets through us. If you do slash zero slash zero, then the 10 zero slash 16, that's for the VNet subnet route, that'll take over. Because that is a more specific route in this case. Correct. You have to define a more specific route than the system router. That's the fundamental requirement. Yes, sir. So the, the VM doesn't default to the ever default to the, the virtual firewall. It doesn't default route to the virtual firewall. It has to go up to the system router and go Correct. Up to the it virtual. always, so very good point. So even after you introduce user-defined routing, right, what we've told is that this VM, when you send packets to the other VM, send it to the firewall. The packet goes from that VM to the system router. The system router knows all packets must go to the firewall. And that's how it gets delivered. It never goes directly from the VM to us. It still always goes to the system router. That's what makes sure that nobody can hijack your network, right? That's part of the core element, right? So that's how user-defined routing work. Now, the beauty of this approach is you can have a single interface to go across multiple subnets, right? In traditional networking, what you would do is for every subnet you're protecting, you would have an interface in that subnet. This is what makes sure that user-defined routing allows you to just use a single interface to bridge across all your internal subnets. Okay, so I'm going to use this notation of red arrows to show you how the UDR rules are operating in the rest of my diagrams to make it simple. I know initially it takes a while to get around it. It took my engineers a couple of months to get around it, okay? And these are really smart, good engineers. But it really works. And once you get familiar, it's really simple. You just define a user-defined routing table, and it forces all packets through us. Okay. So that is an easy way to take care of that. The NSG is really meant to make sure the NSG is a security group. You would say subnet one, subnet two, everybody can only talk to the firewall subnet. Even if you did not set up those, you force everything to the firewall subnet only. So the NSG, even though I called it a basic capability, it's your good security barrier to making mistakes. Right? So, okay, let's talk about a little more details on deployments, right? So. To use hybrid cloud, here's how you would deploy it. You have the Azure VPN gateway. That's gonna terminate your IPsec from your enterprise. By the way, I didn't talk a whole lot about even on-prem side, right? Now, you could have any other vendor's VPN device on your on-prem that does the VPN connection up to Azure. But obviously, if you use our product, you get the greater capability that when your IPsec is egressing from your enterprise, you have a greater way of controlling that traffic. Right? When I say greater way of controlling, what I mean is, let's say you deploy an app, a VNet in Azure for financial applications. What you can make sure is that when that traffic is leaving your enterprise, you make sure that the AD user group for finance can only access that VNet. If you've got a marketing VNet up in Azure, only let the marketing guys go up because we have app ID and user ID. So you can combine those things and say, only these applications for these users can access that VNet up in Azure. Right? This is a really good, simple way of protecting your Azure deployment and making sure that even if something happens in Azure, it gets compromised, threats don't come down to your enterprise. Right? 
So this is even basic sort of simple security you have even before you deploy the virtual firewall in Azure. So here's how you deploy the virtual firewall in Azure for hybrid cloud. You have your Azure VPN gateway that terminates the IPsec. You would put the VM series behind it and you are able to set UDR rules to force all packets through the firewall, right? So the Azure VPN gateway deploys in a subnet called gateway. All packets can be sent through us, right? This is, again, using the UDR capability that I had shown earlier. This forces all packets to go through the firewall. Once you've done that, you don't need to go look at UDRs every day. Every time you create a subnet, you have to add that route table, and that's it, and you're done at that point. Then you only look at the firewall to configure the firewall at that point. And the beauty now is you can use Panorama to manage your on-prem firewall and the Azure firewall at the same time. That's sort of that single pane of glass, single way of managing things. Right? Now in this deployment, I am showing obviously the inter-subnet also, where web going to DB, you're forcing all packets through the firewall, and you apply your traditional segmentation-based rules. So the other de advanced design pattern we're starting to see emerge is the VNet to VNet kind of deployment. This happens when you know, IT or security teams are hosting a core, ser core VNet where you got your Active Directory or some shared file services or some core database that everybody needs to access. And then there are other teams. For example, it might be dev, QA, test that have their own VNets. And if you know dev or test guys, they're all wild, wild west, right? It's test, test, it's their username, password. You don't want those guys coming to your network straight up. Now, Azure has the capability to connect those two networks. Those are pure network level constructs. Essentially, anybody from this VNet can go into this VNet if you connect them. If you use the firewall to basically granularly control it, they can, you, can, you can control which user can go across. You can do all the malware and threat inspection so that you don't have malware from the dev VNet coming into your core services VNet, right? So that's one design pattern we're starting to see in the cloud. A second variation of this is you may have partners that you work with you have your Azure VNet, they have their Azure VNet, they need to talk. And you have different trust levels essentially, right? The story is about different trust levels. One VNet needs to have extreme security, the other VNet may have looser security. By using a virtual firewall, you're able to sort of make sure they can talk, but on a restricted basis. So that's VNet to VNet. And then finally, internet gateway. So this use case has some limitations today that in the next few months we're gonna take care of. Today, you will need to use either a load balancer or a NAT VM in front of us for internet facing deployments. And that's because today there is only a single public IP per VM. So you can use a Citrix or an F5 or any other load balancer that's gonna take internet facing traffic coming in and then we're gonna sit behind it so that all traffic goes through us in and out north south. We can also give you a simple NAT VM, which is like an Ubuntu box with an IP tables rule to force all packets through us. Obviously, this is not intended to be the long-term solution. There's another solution we're working on on this. So I would say stay tuned on this one. If you need to use this for internet-facing things, you can use this, and there should be no issues in using this. We will have a way to deploy this. We will document how you can use this use case. But this use case is a little bit limited right now, and in the next few months, this should get better. And then finally, the global protect use case that I mentioned earlier. Since Azure has a worldwide capability of deployment, you can leverage the VM series, which is a full service appliance, to use it as a global protect gateway, and leverage the worldwide infrastructure Azure has to extend out your security, right? Okay. So, Here's a quick snapshot on the timelines, right? If you attended Lee's session yesterday, he mentioned some timelines, so let me give you a little more specifics. So we are in process of going through the certification from Azure. We've released our 7.1 code. It's with Microsoft. We're going through the final phases of certification and testing. So it should be about two to three weeks before it shows up in the Azure marketplace. So in about two weeks, you go to Azure marketplace, you look up Palo Alto Networks, you'll see us. The bring your own license model will be available at that point. And the pay-as-you-go, the hourly rate model, that's gonna be available in middle of May, right? So here's a quick snapshot of what we're all going to offer. So bring your own license. This is essentially any VM series product, any subscription that you want for IDS, IPS, threat prevention, URL filtering, so on, that's available. 
and then there'll be two choices for the pay as you go, right? So there'll be bundle one, which is the VM300 with threat prevention and support. So support is bundled in, by the way, with the pay as you go model. The intention is that when you deploy it, you need help, you can come to our support portal, create a case, and then get on the phone with, the, with our support staff. And then there's bundle two, which is VM300 with all the four subscriptions for the firewall. So in addition to availability from the Azure marketplace, we will also have a GitHub repository where we give you templates for deployment. The reason I'm mentioning templates is because Azure is really designed to be that modern infrastructure that is for DevOps style deployment, right? You can use their Azure UI to deploy it, but for advanced use cases, for repeat use cases, they use what's called as JSON configuration files, right? They're called Azure Resource Manager, ARM configuration files. So these are JSON files that describe an entire stack or a single resource like a VM. So we will give you templates to easily deploy it. And so these are gonna be in our Azure repository. So GitHub slash uh, Palo Alto Network slash Azure. We'll give you templates, you can go there, read the config, you press a button, it takes you to the Azure console and you can deploy it. That's the templates we give you. You can obviously customize those templates as you like and that's gonna give you that ability to you know, deploy more complex applications. Okay, that was all I had to talk for about. So Sean and I are open for questions. Go ahead. Okay, we got. So the question is on bootstrapping and auto scaling for Azure. So bootstrapping, I showed you that is bootstrapping available. Uh, for Azure. So auto scaling and load balancing are the two additional things. The Azure native load balancer are the two things we are working on right now. So I can't offer anything right now. It's something we're exploring. Basically, it's gonna be accelerated compared to what we did in AWS, for example. It took us a while to get it ready. I think for Azure, we're working a lot closely with Microsoft on load balancing and auto scaling both. So I think stay tuned is all I can say. <laughs> okay. I was looking at the differences or the support for dynamic routing within, because I know we do direct connect with Azure and, and find the dynamic routing with VPN backup is kind of an issue. I, so the question was on dynamic routing, you mean? With Palo Alto, okay. BGP. So, I mean, we do support BGP, so I'm not sure how I could I, specify. Han does, but I, I find with Azure, no. It, it, so not are you? Currently. So I think is you that something direct, going to be in the next releases so, within Azure? So I think you mentioned uh, direct connect. I mean, you express. I suppose you mean express route. You have an express route going in. Express route and and having a dedicated link through Equinix or whatever third party vendor. We do dynamic routing as a failover between VPN versus direct connect to corporate find the dynamic routing isn't supported into Palo Alto via, via the express route. So, um, we, sorry, so we do support it on Azure. Um, I think the, the, we haven't tested actually with, with Palo Alto. So we, and I know that they support it, we just did. Yeah, so just I think we need comment. to test your scenario yeah. and learn a little more. Yeah. There should be no reason why it doesn't get supported. We do support BGP, yeah. OSPF, and those yeah. components, and it's a pure layer three environment. And as long as Azure is supporting it, that shouldn't be an yeah. issue. And I we think we need to do a follow up with you to say, what is going on in that setup. Yeah. I don't see an issue or reason why it should not be supported. So all I can say is I don't know if I've, my team has tested it, but I don't see an issue why it shouldn't work, so we need to do a follow-up with you is all I can say. Okay, yeah, no worries, because I just was trying to implement it last week. So I think after the session, if you can reach out and then we can do a follow-up on yeah. that. No worries, thanks. <laughs> all right, other, okay, there's one more over here. So this Azure public and private, whatever it is, I mean, it has different, different subnets uh, coming along. Uh, can we, because today we define statically policies, uh, is there a way that we can do dynamic policies kind of thing? So Azure keeps on updating the new subnets uh, and it is replicated in the, um, in the firewall policies as well. So, to, so if you attended my previous session, it's called VM monitoring. We do have a feature where we don't care about your subnet specifically. We just care about the tags you assign them, right? If you assign your VM a tag called VWeb, 
and you assign a tackle DB, as long as we see all the traffic using UDR rules, you still have to put the UDR rules to force all traffic to us. We can use that logic of saying web talks to DB, allow traffic if it's your policy. Today, in Azure, we can't natively pull those tags. We haven't built that feature. That's a future feature that we'll be looking to build in. Today, what you will have to do is feed those tags to us. Either you have a simple VM that runs and harnesses those tags and then feeds those tags into us via API, and then you can use the VM monitoring capability to not have to worry about, I'm talking subnet one to subnet two. All you're doing is forcing all packets to us, and then you're just saying web talks to DB allow SQL traffic. So today there is that requirement that you have to feed the tags into us. In the future, we will do some native monitoring. So between this, uh, the same subnet, uh, will this be in deployment gives us a visibility or no? No, not within the same subnet, because inside a subnet, packets will directly go to the other VM. We won't be able to get in that traffic flow. What you can do is, if you want to go, I'll call it go crazy on that UDR rules, you can make slash 32 rules, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> that will force everything to come to us. But that's going to be really cumbersome for you to do, right? You got individually saying every VM send traffic to him. One-to-one -one VM mapping, and that's going to be really not scalable. So intra-subnet is not possible in a convenient way today. I think that's good feedback for them yeah, to say, I mean, yeah. I mean, this is something we, liked, we would like to literally call service chaining or service insertion, right? We are truly a service in a cloud environment, and you literally say, I want the firewall in the path of all traffic. You don't care about where the VMs deployed. But that's something that's a future-looking thing. Today, it's going to be between subnets. Yeah, and just, Will just VXLAN address that issue or no? Sorry, what? The VXLAN? So I think Azure allows all VMs to be layer three only. Yeah. We cannot peak it at a layer two level. Mm -hmm. We don't know if there's VXLAN or NVGRE or what have you underneath. We are pure layer three appliance, right? The reason it's there is so that they're protecting one customer from another customer, right? One tenant from another tenant. They don't want us to peak the, at the VXLAN packet and look at the encapsulation, right? The idea is, Every tenant is separate. They're not going to give us the layer two packet. Yeah, so, so just a couple of things to add to this. So as far as the, the tag thing, um, we are actually coming up with a service where actually a VM can query the environment that it's in. So in this case, it would actually figure out, hey, there's a new subnet in there. And you can actually have a policy in there through scripting that now as soon as the subnet is added, as soon as the VM is added, all the traffic is automatically going to go through the firewall. So this is a service that's actually being added um, later this month um, early next month, actually. Um, as far as, the, as, far as the, the second question that you had, um, so everything's on layer three, and, and that has a, I guess, in a good, has a good and a bad thing. Um, the good thing is that um, because everything's on layer three, we kind of, everything's policy-based, essentially. Everything's done at the Hyper-V uh, at the hyper -V level. So, the, I mean, for UDR, uh, originally it used to be that, you know, you got to have uh, one network arc in, in, in one subnet, another one in another subnet, and then it would get routed. In this case, you just have a single NIC, and it just all the routing is done, right? So that's what I mean, that everything's just policy-based, and <coughs> therefore, you don't have access to the, to the, to the hardware, uh, but that can also be a good thing. So. Yeah. Cool. Other questions, folks? We got everybody. All right. Okay, thank you. We'll be right, around great. if you have other follow-up questions. Thank you, guys.